Imre Lakatos began his philosophical career with some remarkably original essays in the philosophy of mathematics. He plainly hoped to reform this area of philosophy. The introduction to the book version of Proofs and Refutations is forthright. The purpose of these essays is to approach some problems in the methodology of mathematics. The recent expropriation of the term methodology of mathematics to serve as a synonym for metamathematics indicates that in formalist philosophy of mathematics, there is no proper place for methodology qua logic of discovery. Lakatos contended that the discussions among logicians and philosophers of mathematics neglected important questions, indeed the most important philosophical questions about mathematics. Strenuous efforts to reconstruct mathematical knowledge in some preferred fashion completely bypassed issues about how the body of knowledge to be set in order had emerged. Obsessed with tidying up the corpus of mathematical knowledge, philosophers seem completely uninterested in how mathematicians had obtained that knowledge in the first place. Hygienic proposals for arranging the courts took precedence over understanding the ways in which the life of mathematics had proceeded. Were philosophers of mathematics embracing an odd variety of skepticism, Lakatos wondered, tacitly denying any genuine mathematical knowledge before the advent of formal, formal logic? With characteristically acerbic wit, he pointed out that Newton had to wait four centuries until Peano, Russell, and Quine helped him into heaven by formalizing the calculus. Understanding the growth of mathematical knowledge, he thought, might relieve Newton of any strain on his patience. To achieve that understanding would require specifying the methodology of mathematics, that is, identifying the standards governing the rational progress of mathematics. For Lakatos, at this stage of his career, that meant adapting the correct normative theory of the natural sciences to the mathematical case. Convinced that Popper had supplied that theory, his title and his four-part article echoed Sir Karl. Despite the brilliance of his discussion of his major example, the historical development of ideas about the relations of the number of vertices, edges, and faces of polyhedra, initiated by the Descartes-Euler conjecture, I don't think Lakatos solved the problem he posed, nor do I believe that the essays he wrote about mathematics identified the problem in its full generality. Nonetheless, this part of his philosophical work has always seemed to me a major achievement, one that I think remains underrated to this day. For he formulated the right question and offered a convincing treatment of some instances of it. Today's philosophy of mathematics would be far richer and far healthier if its practitioners had paid attention. I think I've always been far more sympathetic than most people to Lakatos's approach to the philosophy of math mathematics, but I have to confess to a previous distortion that's caused me to underrate his achievement. I subordinated the question of elaborating a methodology for mathematics to the project of disputing the standard view then and now, that mathematical knowledge is a priori. Half a century on, though I continue to maintain my heterodox views about the a priority of mathematical knowledge, I no longer take that question to lie at the center of philosophical interest. An account of mathematical methodology drawn from historical studies of the growth of mathematics is far more important. Lakatos saw that clearly. I didn't. So what follows is a belated effort to correct one of the mistakes of my philosophical youth. Between the earliest mathematical practice about which we have a relatively clear and detailed vision and the mathematics for which Frege, Russell, Peano, and Hilbert hoped to supply foundations, a vast number of changes occurred. Even more would have to be considered if we were to study the further evolution of mathematics in the 20th century and in our own. I shall terminate my explorations of history with the status quo as of 1879, the year of Frege's Begriffschrift. Four millennia separate the Babylonian techniques for what we would see as solving equations, simple equations and quadratic equations from late 19th century algebra, analysis, geometry, topology, and probability theory. <clears throat> 
During that long period, changes occurred at a number of different scales. The smallest ones are the most philosophically familiar. A mathematician uses received ideas to prove a new theorem. The largest are those on which I'm going to concentrate. They're the ones revealing the most dramatic enrichment of mathematical language and accepted methods of mathematical reasoning. New notation is introduced, sometimes to express concepts that have not previously figured in mathematics, and others to provide a more perspicuous way of working with familiar concepts, one that enlarges the class of, pers of permissible methods. Replacing Roman numerals with the language we have inherited from Arab mathematicians of the 10th century is an obvious instance of this latter kind of change. The different notations offered by Newton and Leibniz for their versions of the calculus are more ambitious and exemplify the larger change. Lakatos's most famous example, the career of the Descartes-Euler conjecture, is a mid-scale transition. It doesn't leave the language of mathematics unchanged. New concepts are introduced to classify polyhedra. But the novel vocabulary is applicable only to a restricted class of questions that provoke mathematical interest. The principal difficulty with Lakatos's approach to mathematical methodology is, I think, his neglect of a crucial issue. What makes a proposed change worthy of mathematical interest? Where do the questions come from? This issue will be at the heart of my own rival approach. It will be, begin to become visible from a broad brush of treatment of the history of mathematics that focuses on some of the large scale changes generating the mathematics of the late 19th century. The roots of elementary mathematics, the simplest parts of arithmetic and geometry, are buried deep in prehistory, and any attempt to uncover them has to be conjectural. At some point in our deep past, probably long before the invention of writing, our ancestors introduced into their language words for numbers, for the basic arithmetical operations, for shapes, distances, and areas. Perhaps they did so in order to avoid quarrels arising from recognizably unequal division of resources, or to facilitate exchanges of goods. It's not a, a widely known fact, but trade among groups dates back at least 20,000 years. Perhaps the Babylonian interest in equations results from complex regulations about the shares inherited by relatives of different degrees and of different sexes. Perhaps geometrical problems have their origin in efforts to assign portions of land so as to satisfy different claimants. By the beginning of the common era, mathematical practice already outran the practical applications, providing the initial rationales for introducing arithmetical and geometrical concepts. The integration of mathematics into a wide array of ventures surely exceeded its original, more limited roles. Not only surveying and trade, but engineering, finance, and astronomy called for people with developed arithmetical and geometrical skills. But Euclid had already systematized geometry, introducing the idea of proving new theorems, whether or not they've served any useful purpose. Mathematicians had formulated concepts for special types of numbers. Prime numbers are only the most obvious case. Locus problems, equations of several degrees, and Diophantine equations all exercised the mathematical community. It's likely that these explorations were spin-offs from the more immediately practical techniques of arithmetic and geometry. Yet, as we'll see, they provided growing points for major expansion. Fast forward to the early Renaissance. Although the work of using the mathematical framework inherited from the ancients to solve practical problems had intensified, generating further techniques and results within that framework, no significant conceptual expansion had occurred. One large achievement of the interval I've skipped over is the provision of a notation that enabled easier and more systematic methods for applying the fundamental arithmetical operations, doing sums, adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. So if you get fed up during the course of this 
lecture, you could try solving the homework problem, but please don't cheat. <laughs> the traditional parts of mathematics, arithmetic, geometry, and the algebra of polynomial equations had been further developed, both for practical purposes and with respect to solving theoretical problems of the kinds that had been recognized since antiquity, new Euclidean theorems, a few new solutions to locus problems and Diophantine equations, more results about prime and perfect numbers, but nothing really conceptually new. Apart, perhaps, from one step whose full significance took centuries to manifest itself. Given that mathematicians' primary function seemed to be to use established techniques to help the bankers and the bridge builders, it's hardly surprising that they weren't held in high esteem within the academy. It's worth remembering that Galileo sought to be called philosopher, not mathematician. Indeed, some mathematicians who devoted themselves to the abstract in practical problems derived a significant portion of their income from performing Long before the age of television or the internet, an evening's entertainment for the privileged might feature a trip to the Pitti Palace to watch Niccolo Tartaglia or Gerolamo Cardano tackle problems that require a method for solving cubic equations. Possibly on the basis of ideas of earlier mathematicians, Tartaglia had formulated a technique for attacking such problems. Unwisely, he let his friend Cardano in on the secret and was enraged when Cardano published it. His reaction is easy to understand. You don't give away trade secrets. Some modern students don't find the method easy to apply, and very few would have the skill to devise it. Admiration for these mathematicians and for their contemporaries in the same line of work should be increased by knowing that they operated, as all their predecessors right back to Babylon had, without the aid of algebraic notation. The introduction of a perspicuous way of formulating equations came at the end of the 16th century, shortly after the careers of Tartaglia and Cardano, and it began the accelerated expansion giving rise to mathematics as Frege knew it. In 1591, François Viette, originally trained as a lawyer, published a book in which he offered a new notation close to the one still employed for representing algebraic equations. This enabled him to formulate explicitly the formulae underlying the solutions to quadratic equations already achieved by the Babylonians and to cubic equations, the methods of the Italian mathematicians. His work paved the way for one of the most fruitful transitions in the history of mathematics. Listen to this sentence. In 1637, Descartes made public his most important intellectual accomplishment, linking geometry to the new algebra in coordinate geometry. Rightly proud of the power of his method, as he frequently points out, the examples he provides illustrate how to solve infinitely many similar problems. He contrasts the scatter of results painfully generated by previous geometers with the systematic success he can offer the mathematical world. Armed with these tools, mathematicians of the mid-17th century tried to extend them to classical geometrical questions that resisted solution, finding the lengths of segments of curves, constructing tangents and normals, computing areas, and discovering maxima and minima. Descartes himself, Fermat, Roberval, and Cavalieri all achieved some partial advances with these problems. A fully general approach came only at the end of the century with the techniques of the calculus, independently and differently offered by Newton and Leibniz. Though Leibniz won the notational contest and his more uninhibited tolerance for infinitesimals eventually triumphed, Newton's conservative preference for tying the calculus close to geometry played a decisive role in the subsequent transformation of mathematics. For Newton proposed an approach to geometry connecting that part of mathematics with the study of motions. By adopting this kinematic approach, Newton gained the ability to move to and fro between geometry and the theory of motion. Tools crafted for one domain could be applied in the other. In particular, 
the successes of the calculus in solving geometrical problems can be mirrored in kinematics and form the platform on which Newton erected his strikingly successful dynamics. The subsequent history of the calculus is a tale of free swinging success in which most of those who participate don't share Newton's concerns about infinitely little quantities that can be blotted out at the appropriate moments. This is Newton's method of functions, fluxions uh, in modern notation. Only when the liberated appeals to thinking about terms that are sometimes opportunistically positive and sometimes opportunistically treated as zero, only when that starts to fear, interfere with problem solving or when clever substitutions in infinite series generate odd looking conclusions, do mathematicians turn their attention to mopping up what's become an annoying mess? So through the 18th and 19th centuries, clearer conceptions of limit, continuity, convergence, differentiation, and integration emerge, allowing mathematicians to deal with the full array of functions they want to consider. The end result is the real analysis of Weierstrass and his school, in which Frege was trained, Although some mathematicians, Franeker and Dedekin, for example, contended that further steps were required, Frege, of course, has a far more tender conscience than any of them. Between Newton and the late 19th century, there's thus an explosion of mathematical developments and a concomitant change in the status of the mathematician. As the role of differential equations in physical science becomes recognized, the idle games of mathematicians appear in a new light. The so-called useless problems with which they toy generate concepts and methods for doing serious investigation of the natural world. If Cardano and Tartaglia were reborn in the middle of the 18th century, they would no longer be mere entertainers. People like them would deserve prestigious chairs in prestigious academies and bountiful rewards for their ingenious play. So let's pick up one thread in a rich and complex tapestry. Mathematicians quickly discovered that applying the method of the cu for cubic equations sometimes results in bizarre designation of the roots. So if you take the initial equation that I've got there, x cubed minus 15x minus 4 equals 0, and apply the method, you get something that involves the square roots of negative numbers. But Raffaello Bombelli identified four as one of the roots. And so he was inspired to extend the usual application of uh, the standard arithmetic operations to the new, for, new, the new notation. So he defines multiplication for what we would call complex numbers. He then asks, is it possible to choose a value so that these two expressions, these two funny expressions, when added to one another, will yield four? And he sees that what he needs is to choose a value of k so that two plus k times the square root of minus one is um, two plus the square root of minus 121, and similarly for the complex conjugate. If he can do that, the offensive terms go away, and you get 2 plus 2, which is, of course, 4. Bombelli saw that this would work. But as he also recognized, his ability to choose an appropriate value depends on already knowing the value of the root. And because, because he knew that, he knew that 8 minus 6k squared would have to be 2. In general, without knowing the root, you just have to guess at the value for the pertinent parameter. So he dismissed what he'd done as an apparent curiosity. Most of his contemporaries and immediate successors accepted that verdict as subtle and useless. That's what he called the new numbers. A few, however, continued to explore. As Leibniz's successors played unrestrainedly with infinite series, with unchecked tolerance of substitutions, many unproblematic results emerge. So you get series expansions for e to the x, sine x, and cosine x. As Euler saw, 
If you extend these functions to allow complex numbers as arguments, you can obtain a remarkable identity. So you, you shove in iz in place of x, and what you get is a relation between the trigonometric and the exponential functions, which then yields, when you take a special instance, this really peculiar formula, Euler's beautiful identity. So play with the cubic thus started a line of development that has led to an extraordinary connection among trigonometric and exponential functions mediated by numbers most mathematicians had dismissed. Yet this isn't only this is only one part of Tartaglia's and Cardano's legacy. Systematic attempts to solve polynomial equations of higher degree yielded success with the quartic but a frustrating sequence of failures with the quintic. These developments prompted Lagrange at the end of the 18th century to seek an understanding of why particular idiosyncratic substitutions of variables transformed the original cubic equation into an equation of higher degree, a polynomial of degree six in the case of the cubic, that could then be reduced by some formula used for lower degree equations. The sextic equation is a quadratic in the cube of the artfully chosen variable. Given the understanding of the relations between functions of the roots and the coefficients of the original equation, Viet had already started recognizing that, he focused on permutations of the roots, considering those functions that were invariant under permutations. His work made it clear why the techniques for cubic and quartic were successful, and it inspired early 19th century mathematicians Abel in Gal and Galois in particular, to introduce the concept of a group. The night before the duel in which he would be killed, Galois wrote out a synopsis of his ideas, revealing why the quest for a solution to the quintic was doomed. One final episode from 19th century mathematics will complete my extremely idiosyncratic and whirlwind review of some important transitions. Late 18th century studies of complex numbers introduced the notion of the complex plane as an analog of the real number line. They inspired William Rowan Hamilton to ask if there were higher dimensional numbers. Hamilton first sought a three-dimensional generalization. Relatively quickly, he convinced himself of the impossibility of generalizing in ways that would preserve the features of the elementary arithmetic operations he took to be important. The four-dimensional case appeared much more promising, although he encountered recurrent difficulties in defining multiplication. Over a period of many years, he would retreat to his study to work on the problem. According to legend, when he emerged, his wife would ask, have you discovered quaternions yet? And he would ruefully shake his head. Hamilton filled many waste paper baskets with potential multiplication tables, all of which failed. Finally, on a walk around Dublin, inspiration came, and he carved the multiplication table into the stonework of a bridge. The breakthrough was to abandon commutativity. We don't talk about Hamilton's numbers as quaternions anymore. Instead, his work, like that of Abel and Galois, is absorbed in the abstract algebra already developed by Frege's time, and that has become central to the mathematics of the 20th century. So I've given you a whirlwind tour of a few of the major transitions that give rise to the body of mathematics for which a few mathematicians and many more philosophers have sought foundations. If we reject Lakatos's satirical suggestion that there was no mathematical knowledge until the foundationalists provided it, or since it's not clear that it's yet been given, there's no mathematical knowledge at all, we're faced with two obvious and connected questions. What makes these kinds of transitions in mathematics, the transitions out of which modern mathematics grew, reasonable? What makes them deserve the title of advances? We need accounts of mathematical reasonableness and mathematical progress that accommodate the history I've handled, admittedly, very roughly and crudely. So some preliminaries. I should explain how I think about progress in mathematics and in the natural sciences, 
and I should defend my preference for talking about reasonableness in this context, rather than adhering to the more familiar idiom of rationality. Many people, I think, adopt a very narrow view of progress, keyed to salient examples. Unless you're Don Quixote, your travels aim at a destination, and your progress is measured by the decreasing difference between you and your goal. Some kinds of progress are like that. Many are not. Children learning to play musical instruments make progress by overcoming their technical problems and improving their interpretive skills. The technology of computers and smartphones makes progress by eliminating the glitches of the current devices and increasing the range of things they can do. Teleological progress is progress to, pragmatic progress is progress from. In mathematics, as in science, progress is pragmatic progress. So that's a view about progress. Now an idea about reasonableness. Following the ideas about significance that have been inculcated during your apprenticeship, which is what most of us do when we take up questions in research, is usually a reasonable strategy. But since the notion of rationality oscillates between two unsatisfactory senses, it's better to talk about reasonableness in considering the advances of the sciences and the advances of mathematics. One sense is far too thin Rationality is opposed to irrationality, which means rad madness. Nobody ought to be interested in guidelines for not acting madly. The other notion, a technical notion, an artifact of much work in philosophy of science, is embedded in a technical formalism, often elegant, but inapplicable to any number of different contexts of inquiry. The difficulties of specifying appropriate constraints on assignments of probabilities and utilities are all too well known. Methodology does better by seeking informal canons of good judgment, canons of reasonableness. So I hope these two rather brief summaries of things I believe clear the decks for approaching the kinds of historical episodes I've briefly described with an eye to eliciting characterizations of the problems and solutions through which mathematics is expanded from Babylon to late 19th century Jena. So here are some very obvious features of the episodes I've described. Start with Hamilton's search for quaternions. It's clearly motivated by the urge to generalize. Bombelli tentatively proposed to extend arithmetic to encompass new numbers, and his successors eventually recognized the fecundity of doing so. Recognizing that complex numbers can be identified with ordered pairs of reals, Hamilton saw Bombelli's initial move as extending the arithmetical operations to cover ordered pairs of reals. Is a further extension possible? Can you do it for ordered triples? No. For ordered quadruples? Yes. But it takes some effort and the abandonment of a principle that holds for multiplying real numbers and complex numbers alike, the principle that xy is equal to yx. Commutativity has to go, but there's a systematic relation that obtains when commutativity lapses. For some of Hamilton's new numbers, xy equals minus yx. Let's stop for a moment and ask why Hamilton judged the case of triples to be insoluble. The answer. Familiar constraints on the arithmetical operations would have to be amended without offering any regular way of doing so. Extending the system of mathematics with which you're working to introduce expressions that satisfy a previously unsatisfiable requirement can typically be done, but most of the time it leads nowhere. I'm going to use a very simple example to make the point. Imagine yourself before the introduction of negative numbers. As things now stand, x minus y is undefined when x is less than y. I'm an ambitious young mathematician, eager to make my mark. I decide to generalize. I shall introduce a, new single, a single new expression, big N, to denote the negative. For any values of x and y such that x is less than y, x minus y equals big N. Have I succeeded in my goal? No, you reply, 
pointing out that I've now trivialized arithmetic by making all numbers identical. One minus two equals N, which is equal to one minus three. Switch terms with change of sign. One equals one plus two minus three equals zero, and we're now off to the races. But I've anticipated this rejoinder. I point out that standard arithmetic practices are not allowed in equations where big N figures. So my extension preserves all of positive whole number arithmetic. You should find that response absolutely exasperating. You'd be entirely justified in deriding my proposal on the grounds that it goes nowhere. Let's call extensions that go nowhere dumb extensions. Hamilton judged that all ways of defining the arithmetical operations for triplet numbers are dumb, but that abandoning commutivity for quaternions leads to an extension that isn't dumb, that's interesting. Note that when Bombelli originally announced his proposals for the arith arithmetic of complex numbers, he worried that he was proposing a dumb extension. That's what lies behind his description of them as subtle and useless. Was that just modesty? I don't think so. Operating in the context of a method for solving cubic equations, assumed to be fully general, he wanted to be able to extract cube roots of complex numbers to specify the value of A plus BI uh, to the one third and its con complex conjugate to the one third for any values of A and B without guessing in advance the roots of the equation to be solved. In effect, he is recognizing his extension of the arithmetic operations to enable the supposed algorithm to work just in the cases where you don't need it. That's one specific way in which a candidate extension can go nowhere. But by the time Euler celebrates the beautiful identity, complex numbers have been embedded in a number of different contexts, and most pertinently, they expose a connection between exponential functions and trigonometric functions, thus fostering the definition of the hyperbolic analogues of the trigonometric function, but then turn out to have interesting physical applications, for example, in studying hanging chains. The beautiful identity condenses all this, the aesthetic tribute fully deserved by the fact that when three interesting and mysterious numbers, e, pi, and i, are connected in a mysterious way. What on earth do you mean by raising the base of natural logarithms to the power i pi? You get an everyday negative integer. Underlying Hamilton's judgment then is a long history. Practical problems lead Babylonians to investigate equations and thus inspire a search for methods to solve them. They succeed with two important classes simple first degree equations and quadratic equations, even though they lack any perspicuous method for making the methods, any perspicuous notation for making the method explicit. Few cubic equations have the same practical payoff, but the game of solving them becomes fun to play for mathematicians and apparently fun to watch for the aristocracy. And Cardano publishes a method. Difficulties in understanding that method in a whole range of instances provoke Bombelli to generalize real arithmetic. As that generalization proves fruitful in a wide number of cases, imaginary numbers become accepted. Hamilton tries to generalize further. The three-dimensional attempt forces him to modify without providing any systematic understanding of multiplication. The extension is unlikely to bear much fruit. On the other hand, the multiplication table for quaternions offers a pleasing symmetry. And he goes on to show how it can be extended further. In the instances where commutativity fails, we find anti-commutativity. The algebra for these numbers appears worth exploring further. Hamilton's reasonableness consists in his emulation of a mathematical practice that has proved useful in the past. Pragmatic concerns enter the, into the judgments of all the major characters in the story. Tartaglia and Cardano play mathematical games because they and their fellows enjoy the games. The games are harmless and outsiders find them entertaining. Bombelli's modesty is grounded in recognizing that his extension won't do the work for which he undertook it. 
Euler's enthusiasm rests on seeing that extension is useful for all sorts of questions that interest mathematicians, that some of the answers to those questions can play a role in investigation of natural phenomena, and that it provides aesthetic satisfaction. Edna St. Vincent Millay got it slightly wrong. It's not just Euclid, it's Euler as well. Hamilton sees his own enterprise as potentially having all these virtues. And despite the fact that we no longer think of quaternions as special numbers, history has justified his confidence. Sometimes the grounds for supposing an extension to be worthwhile are more straightforward than in the history I've reviewed. Consider the streamlining afforded by introducing Arabic numerals or by Viet's notation. In the first instance, the change eases the daily work of all those who do arithmetic, whether they're mathematicians pursuing projects of no obvious practical significance, or accountants, or shopkeepers, or engineers. In the second, the benefits for extra mathematical practice are less evident, at least at first, but the new notation helps anyone who has to solve an algebraic equation. And within mathematics, it aids the search for methods for solving the quartic and until Galois ventures beyond. Moreover, the power of this style of notation is revealed in Descartes' coordinate geometry, and even more spectacularly in the emergence of the calculus and in its scientific payoffs, first in Newtonian dynamics, and then through the growing incorporation of differential equations in physics. When mathematicians provide tools for addressing scientific problems, their discipline can no longer be dismissed as mere game playing. It's no accident that Newton's work is done in the middle of a century, during which the status of the mathematician is dramatically elevated a Galileo active in the mid 18th century would not have been so anxious to be known as a philosopher rather than a mathematician. Moreover, Newton's paradigmatic achievement is bracketed by two other practically fruitful expansions of mathematics. Pascal considers how to divide up the antecedent stakes in unfinished games of chance and establishes the theory of probability as a new mathematical discipline. Euler muses on the difficulty of traversing the bridges of Königsberg without retracing your steps and takes the first steps towards topology. In all three instances, new mathematics is, we might to say, purpose-built, growing out of efforts to tackle practical problems outsiders can recognize. The extent to which pragmatic goals dominate can be appreciated by considering the career of the calculus from the 1680s to the late 19th century. For a very long time, the obvious difficulties with the methods practitioners employ, obvious enough to be lucidly pointed out by an Anglican bishop, were mostly ignored. For Newton and Leibniz, both dead by the time Barclay's Analyst was published in 1734, the characterization of the central method would not have been news. Both knew they were treating small quantities, sometimes as positive and sometimes as zero. Conservative Newton preferred from the beginning to develop a complex geometrical account that would undergird the maneuvers he allowed himself. The result was a mathematical tradition, prominent in Britain, but very much a minority in the rest of Europe, that proceeded slowly by cautious steps. In the hands of the Leibnizians, the Boy Bernoulli's, Euler, and an increasingly large majority of mathematicians, a deluge of results poured in from functional analysis, making the post-Newtonian approach appear a quaint irrelevance. 18th century analysis reveals the triumph of the pragmatic rationale for extending mathematics. But eventually the piper had to be paid for pragmatic reasons. To solve the problems the analysts wanted to tackle, they had to become clearer about just when their free-swinging methods would let them down. This occurred piecemeal, as different mathematical interests exposed difficulties with different aspects of mathematical practice, with convergence or continuity or differentiation or integration. They needed explanations of when a method worked and when it didn't, explanations that could guide them when they couldn't just see that a potential result was absurd. The pragmatic virtue that sometimes prompts and warrants acceptance of mathematical extension is sometimes an increase in understanding. <laughs>
Two episodes crudely outlined in my history can be approached in terms of explanation and understanding. To his mathematical contemporaries, Descartes offered new ways of understanding traditional geometrical problems. Consider, for example, locus problems. The ancients discovered answers to a few questions of the form, what is the locus of a point which is at some fixed distance from a point or a line or from several points. So for example, the locus of a point whose distance from some fixed point remains constant is a circle. A point such that the sum of its distances from two fixed points is constant is an ellipse. Ancient mathematicians had gone far beyond such elementary instances, but as was well known in the early 17th century, vast numbers of general classes of locus problems existed that could only be solved for the simplest cases. As the geometrie proudly declares, the algebraic reformulations enable mathematicians not only to solve a vast number of previously intractable pro tractable problems, but also to explain why the limited techniques they replaced worked when they did. Similarly, Lagrange attempted to understand why the available techniques for solving a cubic and quartic equation succeeded. He wanted to know why that cunning trick works. Indeed, why any substitution should transform the equation to one that would succumb to methods of devised for equations of lower degree. To this end, he introduced a new idea, thinking about functions of the roots that remain invariant under permutations. Now, it's tempting to assimilate both of these cases to a pattern of change much heralded in discussions about science, the idea that scientific theories grow by developing deeper and deeper explanations. And since the kind of explanation provided isn't readily assimilated to causal explanation, to invite us to seek some other general account of explanation that will apply across the board, underlying mathematical explanation high-level theoretical explanation in the natural sciences, and ultimately, perhaps, causal explanation. An incautious philosopher who went down this road might be led to propose that explanation is fundamentally unification. I hope that, as I've grown older, I've become wiser. Also, that a sign of wisdom is abandoning the search for any general theory of explanation across the board. For understanding, isn't a general ideal, something to be achieved completely in particular instances, and perhaps to be achieved completely with respect to everything. Here too, it's easy to equate progress, progress in understanding with approximating some long range goal. But I suggest that the progress of our understanding is another instance of pragmatic progress, not only in the sense that the goal is an impossible one, there are far too many questions, and however long we lived, we've never run out of potential puzzles. Also, because the questions are diverse, and the ideal of understanding, even in specific cases, would never be realized. Pragmatists should start in a different place, I think, with misunderstanding, and appreciate that misunderstanding comes in many guises. Misunderstanding runs through my history of mathematics. Descartes and Lagrange wanted to know how to do more generally things they could do partially. They would also like to see why the available methods succeed where they do. Euler responds to the bizarre results obtained by the technique of substituting an infinite series and asks what has gone wrong? What differentiates these from the many instances in which the technique delivers a new result whose correctness can be recognized by doing a bit of arithmetic? Bolzano wants a rein analytischer Beweis of the theorem that a continuous function that takes positive values for some arguments and negative values for others must have a zero somewhere. He wonders what the relation between analysis and geometry is and why we need the detour of thinking about curves drawn on paper without lifting the pencil. That's the standard way of proving that theorem in his time. Galileo, Bolzano, and Dedekind all want to know how to handle a paradox of the infinite. They want to know whether there are more natural numbers than even numbers. 
Does the inclusion criterion settle relative size, or should we appeal to one-to-one -to -one correspondence? Cauchy and Abel want to know if there can be Fourier series representations of discontinuous functions. They also want to know which one of them has made a mistake. Bombelli wants to know the relation between the odd expression involving square roots of negative numbers and the roots of the cubic equations. Gauss, Bolya, and Lobachevsky are puzzled by the difficulties in trying to prove Euclid's fifth postulate and wonder if they can evade them by using reductio ad absurdum and thus are led to non-Euclidean geometry. Notice I've, I've set it all up in terms of a bundle of explanation-seeking questions which reflect the misunderstandings or the forms of misunderstandings that provoke the inquiry. Forty years ago, Bas van Frassen offered a pragmatic theory of explanation. To explain, he suggested, is to answer a why question distinguished by a topic and a contrast, contrast class. Explanation is achieved by giving a sentence that stands in a relevance relation to the topic and the contrast class. Van Frassen placed no constraints on relevance, and as Wesley Salmon and I showed, this led to a trivialization of his account, anything can explain anything. Salmon and I assumed that an adequate theory of explanation must supply a characterization of the re relevance relation. We differed on what that account should be. Salmon opted for a particular causal relation. I proposed that relevance relations were those generated from the patterns figuring in the best overall unification of our beliefs. We were both mistaken. Salmon appreciated Van Frassen's insight far earlier than I did. Even though a vast number of relations are not relevance relations, the class of relevance relations is diverse. It contains more than one. That was Salmon's version. It contains many. That's now the version I would adopt. That's the core of a pragmatist non-theory of explanation. Explanation-seeking explanation questions come in many varieties, and with respect to each of the varieties, there are diverse appropriate relevance relations apt in different contexts. To go beyond this non-theory is a matter of exploring the diversity and characterizing the relevance relations in ways that show how they meet the needs of the context in which the explanation seeking question arises. So there are varieties of misunderstanding, and the philosophical task is to recognize the various species and how each one of them gets addressed. So I'm going to pull the threads of my discussion together. During the long period I've surveyed, mathematics expands and thereby makes progress. It does so by building on and generalizing parts of the accepted mathematics of the past. Some expansions allow mathematicians to address questions they've previously been unable to tackle or only to answer partially. Others are directed towards understanding the limited successes of methods previously employed or resolving other kinds of misunderstanding. Sometimes mathematics is directed towards some particularly puzzling natural phenomenon, the purpose-built mathematics of Pascal and Newton and Euler. At others, it issues in new systems mathematicians take pleasure in exploring, new games that are fun to play and even attractive to those who watch. The pleasures enjoyed can be aesthetic. By assimilating mathematics to game playing, I may seem to be insulting its dignity. I don't think so. Renaissance patrons may have condescended to the mathematical performers they invited in for the evening, according them the status appropriate to the conjurer brought in for the children's party or the touring grandmaster who comes to play simultaneously against 40 local chess players. But our attitude ought to be different. We should endorse the social shift that occurred between the 16th century and the 18th century. It's turned out to be a very good idea to provide mathematicians with a license to pursue the games that interest them. Not only has it offered them and a wider public plenty of amusement, Martin Gardner's mathematical games column in Scientific American was eagerly devoured by many readers. It's even offered them glimpses of Beauty Bear, it's also furnished large numbers of tools for use in investigating the natural and social worlds. The perspective I've offered is supported by recognizing the opportunistic ways in which different types of inquiry borrow from one another. Borrowing occurs within mathematics. Andrew Wiles' famous proof of Fermat's last theorem 
the proof of the century, built on previous efforts to connect previously separate branches of mathematics. It also happens across independent provinces of scientific investigation. The game theory, originally introduced to study human interactions, inspired evolutionary biologists to elaborate it in a particular way, and the results of their extensions have fed back both into the original socio-political investigations and into mathematics. The history of mathematics is intertwined with that of the natural and social sciences, in which ideas travel and grow in crisscrossing paths to meet the needs of current inquiry. The games mathematicians play have turned out to be wonderful sources of concepts and techniques for many people to use. No wonder mathematicians are held in high regard, even when they only seem to be playing. Play seems to be going on in Lakatoshi's classroom. Is it a cooperative or a competitive game? Lakatosh provides us with a detailed, but historically streamlined account of a particular series of progressive steps in mathematics. The initial question is prompted by a long recognized piece of elementary geometry. The number of angles in a polygon is equal to the number of sides. Is there a similar relation in the three-dimensional case for polyhedra. The discussion begins after decisions have already been made about how to specify similarity. The class asks after the relation between the number of faces, vertices, and edges. The question has no obvious practical significance. It is spurred, as so many questions in the history of mathematics seem to be, by an interest in generalizing from an existing part of mathematics. Think of Bombelli, Descartes, and Hamilton. As the question is explored, difficulties are generated, and the class seeks ways to circumvent them, just as Euler did with respect to bizarre series summations, and Cauchy and Abel did when faced with a puzzle about sums of continuous functions. Lakatoshi's account of the steps is, I think, easily liberated from his reliance on Popperian ideas, and it fits within the larger framework I've sketched. So I end as I began with an acknowledgement of the brilliance of his work in this area of philosophy. The philosophy of mathematics ought to be developed by investigating the methodology behind mathematical practice, using a general historiographical framework, not necessarily the one I've outlined here, to re reveal the reasonableness and progressiveness of particular transitions, the virtues sought and attained. Proofs and refutations is a paradigm of how that can be done. I hope a future philosophy of mathematics, liberated from the scholastic debates that have dominated professional activity in this area, will imitate Lakatosh, and I hope that future philosophers of mathematics will look back on him as the founder of the subject as it ought to be pursued. Thank you.